I was hoping to go to junior church. <laughs> How disappointing. I have to stay in here and listen to me. So sorry, kids. How many of you would have gone to junior church? Oh, yeah, figures. Oh, nice. Okay, apparently all ages. Wow. Getting heckled. And I haven't been up here for 30 seconds. I like, hey, our name is on the sign. How nice. That was nice. And my name was spelled correctly. I still can't get my brother to spell it with two B's. It's the way it is on the birth certificate. It's R-O-B-B. And I think he does that out of spite or something. I don't have any idea. But he can't seem to get it right. It is a a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the rain. That was very nice. That was a nice touch. Um, Being from Arizona, it actually was a nice touch. I'd forgotten what that looks like and uh, how much I didn't like it. So... Uh, But you needed it, right? That's what I'm hearing, so that's always good news. Um, Wonderful with uh, Mark and uh, in the back there and others on the search team, and thank you. been very nice meeting you over the phone and Zoom, and then in person. This is a pleasure uh, to be with you. If you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 12. I think these are some thoughts that are very fitting for a church as a whole, as well as for us individually, uh, that I think that you'll, um, you, may, uh, you may agree. It's Luke 12. We're going to start in verse 22. Father, thank you for an opportunity you've given us to be here today. What a pleasure. And I'd ask that your Holy Spirit would Calm our hearts and allow us to listen to your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. This story, it's very familiar. The topic is don't worry, but it's not really the topic. It's the setup. There's a way to get us to listen to the subject. And it's set up, if you look at the passage in verse 22, it says, he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, or... Um, I think it's the RSV that says, on this account, and then he tells the story about not being anxious for your life and not worrying, and he gives examples for that. Well, on this account, meaning the story right before it was an interesting setup of an account. Somebody in the crowd yelled out to Jesus, hey, tell my older brother to split inheritance with me. And Jesus responded by saying, you're asking the wrong person, and it's not important. On this account, or because of this, don't be anxious about your life, verse 22, what you'll eat or your body, what you'll put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. So the setup on inheritance was, You're asking me this, and it's such a small part of what life is, I'm not interested. I'm not going to engage on this subject because life is bigger than this. And on this account, because of that conversation, he says, don't be anxious about your life or what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Topic is worry, but the topic isn't exactly worry. Worry is the symptom of a misplaced value. We worry about things because we're missing a bigger picture. So if we just simply said today, gave all the reasons in the Bible passages on why you shouldn't worry, and tell you not to worry... I, for one, will leave here worrying most of the day that I worry too much. I think you just would add a whole new level of worrying for me. Because he's not combating the symptom of worry with don't worry. He's combating the topic of worry with the big picture of what we are to be consumed with. So the subject, actually a little broader, If we were to figure out how do we live a life consumed by God's kingdom, 
by Jesus Christ as our King and us living within His kingdom, His reign and His rule, if we were to consume ourselves with that, worry doesn't happen. If we worry, it sends the message we are not being consumed by the reign and the rule of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So it's a great little symptom and it's like a litmus test. So you and I have so many things that we want to worry about and as we concern ourselves and become anxious about everything or anything, note it as a signal in your own mind to say, I am not consumed with the bigger picture, which is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, His reign and rule over my life. Because if you and I grasp that, if we lived as we believe in our mind that He reigns and rules over everything, the fact that you were swindled out of X amount of money, He was reigning and ruling over those circumstances in your life, then why are you worrying? Well, because I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, keep talking. Or I should say, keep digging. Because we continually are revealing the fact that we are to live under the reign and rule of our Heavenly Father and King Jesus. And as we do, that when your child goes through a struggle of some sort that really may not make it out so well, you'd say, oh no, this is extremely painful. I don't like it. I would change it if I could. But I'm so consumed with the knowledge and understanding that Jesus Christ rules over my life, then I'm okay with it. It's the Apostle Paul saying, I've learned in any circumstance to be content because he rules and he reigns. I think of it as an umbrella. His reign and his rule, kingdom thought as an umbrella. And I want to live under that thinking. You wanted to buy that car, but then all of a sudden it was gone. And it was such a good deal, and you can't believe it. And there really is a frustration in you because you needed the good deal. You actually needed the car. There's that frustration where you've slipped out from under the umbrella by saying, that isn't working to my favor. And we go, oh, no, no, the umbrella says all things work to the glory of God in your life and for your good. You want to slip under the umbrella or not? This happened to my family, or the court case didn't go the way you wanted it to go. And you're like, that's so frustrating, up against a court, and it didn't go the way you wanted the frustration, the anxiety of that. Yeah, when we're outside, kingdom thought. So worry is unease or anxiety over real or seemingly potential problems. Now, I read the stat, and it doesn't seem to help, but the stat was, and it was by Penn State, they uh, had a statistic that said only 8% of the things that you worry about actually happen. And I'm like, is that supposed to help? Because now I'm really worried about what 8%? You know, I mean, if it were 98, then I'd at least relax and go, okay, like Eeyore, and say, oh, okay, it's going to rain again. But 8%, that didn't help me any. 8%. It's the anxiety, the unease. I also was looking and saw that worry causes suppression of the immune system. Worry, anxiety, uh, causes digestive problems, muscle tension, short-term memory loss, short-term memory loss. Uh, That was kind of funny, wasn't it? Um, Premature coronary artery disease, heart attack, stroke high blood pressure. I'm not kidding. I read all that. My anxiety just increased. I'm like, I'm seeing some of these symptoms, and I'm like, oh man, this is is a problem. So take a look with me. We're going to break this down and find our way to the point, and this is the good news, is we're going to find ourselves all the way to the end where we can 
know exactly how to walk out of here living under the reign and the rule of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The common problem, and we're consumed with, is the topic of worry. But I'm fascinated that it made it into the subjects of which are recorded from Jesus. It seems a bit benign. There are bigger, I was going to say better sins. There are bigger sins. There are sins that are pretty significant. Worry is one of them. And I'm like, that's a little odd. Take a look at the passage, and I'll explain this. This is verse 22. I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you eat, or your body, what you'll put on. For life is more than food, the body more than clothing. Now, he gives an example. So he's expanding the idea. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can even add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you're not able to do as small as things as this, why are you anxious about the rest? Gives another example. Consider the lilies. They grow. They don't toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, all his glory aren't arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive today in the field and then tomorrow thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? This is serious. He's not only saying don't worry, he's now giving examples of it. You may recall... The Gospels tell us that if everything were recorded that Jesus had said, that not the, the whole world wouldn't contain the books of everything they said, right? So there's a lot that we didn't get to have here. Equally inspired. Inspired because he said it. So out of all of the array, certain things were chosen. And apparently, most wasn't. Now, the Gospels as a genre, the Gospels as a form of writing, the Gospels are not a biography. That's not the form of writing. A biography is to tell you a whole view of picture of somebody for that purpose so that you have a good understanding of them. People say, why do we not get to hear much about the childhood of Jesus? We have so little about that. Well, it's not a biography. The Scriptures tell us why the Gospels were written. They were actually, John said, these are written that you would believe. Luke said the purpose of his writings was that you would know with certainty those things that he taught. That's why they were written. Think of this for a second. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written so that you would believe Jesus Christ and have a certainty in what he said. Based on that, this story, the idea of worry is actually included in it. Because the point is yet to come. He's hinting at, at the end of verse 28 when he says, O ye of little faith. He's condemning this thought process that you're concerned about these daily things. And I'll tell you, it's not that they're not important because you need to eat and you need to feed your kids and you have a child that was born and everything was fine and, you, and now that you find out the child is autistic and you have now new challenges. The child is as beautiful as every child and you love the child the way the child is, but you have new challenges. Or you have a marriage that was so good, then it dissolved. And now you don't know what's going to happen. You have real life challenges. And he goes, I don't know, why, you're, why are you concerned about this? Consider the ravens, consider the lilies. We're getting to the point. Worry is the way to get us to the point. Worry is the way in which we're having the point revealed to us. The point isn't don't worry. You can't create a negative space in your mind. If I say to you, 
Well, like if I just simply said, don't worry the rest of the day. You are going to so worry about worrying all day long. I had some friends in college that they decided, they were, uh, we were at Liberty University, and they were, these, these guys were worried about lust, and so they had a couple of verses, Bible verses, on don't lust, and they, they kind of made a pact, and they said, hey, every time that you lust, what you need to do, you need to go sit somewhere and read this verse. For like three days, every time I saw one of those guys, they were sitting somewhere by themselves reading this verse. And I'm like, well, because you can't tell yourself to negate. You can't create an empty space. You have to fill the space. If I said to you right now, do not under any circumstance think about a pink elephant. Do not have a pink elephant in your mind right now with a bow. And then you tell yourself all day, don't think about it, don't think about it. You can't negate. It has to be filled. So the subject is don't do this. And the reason it's made it to such a high level of priority is because of what it's replacing. It's replacing kingdom thought. Take a look at verse 29. And do not seek what you are to eat or what you're to drink nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Here it is, verse 31. Instead, seek His kingdom, and then all of these things that you're worried about and thinking about and striving for, all of those are added to you. In one sentence, we have the point. It's clear that the kingdom of God is central to the message of Jesus. So this is now, a worry is a subject that made the, uh, made the cut as a way to get to the point of which he has said over and over and over again. So in the Gospels themselves, there are 63 different times that he is speaking of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. 63 times. Like 85 times if you count the doubles. Matthew, 49 times he talks kingdom of God. Mark, 16 times. In Luke, 38 times. It's kingdom of God. Kingdom. It wasn't one of the messages of Jesus. It was his message. Interestingly, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, right? The three that see similarly, synoptic. Those three run the same. They're very similar. And then there's John that's just off. If you know a John, they're always a little off, right? Do we not know any Johns or you just disagree? Okay. Yeah, I'm right. So John only mentions the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven twice. And yet, his entire book is the source of it. It's the belief in Jesus Christ, the source of the kingdom of God. The gospel, if you were to define gospel, I think most of us would say the same definition, uh, good news, right? Gospel means good news. Um, true very broadly true. But you wouldn't say, like if somebody showed up right as service was ending with a big stack of pizza, I would say good news, right? Well, I've never seen a pizza that I haven't said good news. But I'm not going to speak the gospel to it. I'm not going to say that's the gospel coming in the door. I mean, it's shy of, depends what's on it. Because gospel is more specific. Gospel is, the word is eungelion, the gospel is a proclaiming an heir to the throne. It's good news, there's a king. So it's good news in a particular context. 
There's an heir to the throne. It's tidings of deliverance, gospel. As he's proclaiming the gospel, he's proclaiming the news that there is a king, and this king has a way of, which, of himself, and that way is available to you and to me today. That's what gospel means. So when we're saying about the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven being central message of Jesus, it is the message of Jesus. And when you and I are consumed with worrying about our kid of whether or not they're going to be okay or a marriage that's broken or family that's uh, broken or finances that are being ripped off and you aren't being treated right, all horrible things. But as we're consumed with all of those things, with worry and anxiety, that is running in contrast to our spoken belief that Jesus Christ is king. Is he king or is he not king? Because if he's king, his reign and rule is able to dominate over your life by your choice. Or not. Or we can say, yeah, I pray, Jesus, forgive my sins and give me a home in heaven, or however we want to word that prayer, and we could say it, and then we walk away and we live exactly like the world, and we're worried about everything the world is worried about, because we haven't chosen to live within the kingdom of heaven. And as a church, to choose to live in the kingdom of heaven and to promote the kingdom of heaven and to judge ourselves and evaluate ourselves based on our living within the kingdom of heaven. When the world says, uh, get to the front of the line, that's world thinking. You need to be first. Kingdom thinking is, oh, no, no, the last will be first. And you go, oh, what? See, his teaching was explaining the way in which the kingdom functions. Because living in the kingdom of God has ways in which it functions. And it's totally different than the world and how it functions. The world says that you need to be great and you need to promote yourself and you, you're amazing because you're going to make it a long ways and you just keep going. No, kingdom says, oh, no, you need to be a servant to everybody. You go, what? But that's opposite. Of course it's opposite. Because Satan has created the worldly system in contrast to the system of the kingdom of heaven. Our Heavenly Father has never intended for you to go to bed at night consumed and worried about that relationship. He never intended for that to happen. That's the world's way. How those bills will be paid. What's going to happen with your child when they get older and they're not going to be able to take care of themselves and you're consumed with it? Yeah, that's, the world is consumed with that. We're consumed with kingdom thought that we trust our Heavenly Father. Oh, but this is pretty big. Yeah, exactly. It is. It's huge. Your concern is huge. Don't diminish the concern. But what we do is we turn and we live under his kingdom. little theology real quick for those of you that are interested. The kingdom of God is his reign and rule. So we live under his reign and his rule, or we don't. So it shows itself, I believe, in a literal thousand-year reign and rule of Jesus in the future. That's what my eschatology. So get a little theology out for us. So sorry again that there's no junior church. More of you would be there right now if given the chance. Um, I believe in a thousand-year reign. Well, but the thousand-year physical reign of Jesus Christ in your theology is a phase or an extension of his reign and rule happens to be in a thousand year reign. Because he actually said 
the rain, it's, it's within you. Don't look ahead. It's now. That's another phase that we can choose. And whether you're living in a jail cell or whether or not you're living in a beautiful house, it, you're not limited at all. Whether you're alone or you're with tons of people or a dorm room, it doesn't make any difference. You have the choice of living under the reign and rule of our Heavenly Father or not. There is a third phase, which is his sovereign rule. All three have something in common. The kingdom of God is his reign and rule. The gospel is proclaiming that. The good news of Jesus Christ is that he wants to reign in your life in all of your concerns, in all of your problems and your issues, he wants to have full reign and rule, and we can trust him that everything that happens will bring glory to him and it will be to your best. Wow. Why wouldn't we want that? Because we're selfish. We want to solve it. So we take it and we hold on to it. If you look at verse 23... Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. That was the hint. Why are you anxious? Life is more than food, body, and clothing. Set up on the inheritance issue. I'm not going to solve your inheritance issue. That's a minor part of your life. There's something bigger at stake here. And then we go down to 31. 30 says the nations... Well, now we know what the nations of the world, they seek after those things. They're on a treadmill. But not us. Instead, seek his kingdom. And these things will be added to you. Take a look at you, Wood. Kind of a side note. Is this practical step in verse 32? I like it because he, he's playing this thing out and he says, so fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, sell possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that don't grow old, with treasure in heaven that doesn't fail, where no thief approaches, moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is a great practical application. He goes, yeah, you're living in the world, though. You have things and you have concerns. Make sure they're not growing roots. Make sure your money isn't growing roots. So give money away. Treat it as a commodity that comes and goes. You just use things as they're useful. Buy things for their lasting nature and their usefulness. So just let go of things. Let go of the money. Let go of the things. Let go of the kids. He loves your kids more than you love your kids. Your finances, you really, you got into a a problem, whether you created it, um, which seems to cause more worry for us than if it was created for us. The end is the same. We're in trouble. Let go of it. Well, I can't. I'm so bothered by it. No, you're right. You can't. Actually, that's true. You have to cling to something else. You cling to your relationship with Jesus Christ and you live in the acknowledgement daily that He is reigning and ruling in your life and you'll let go and what happens is what he wants and I'm going to walk through it but trust him completely with it and your kids are that way if you have an issue with your child grown child doesn't matter how old they are sure wish you could spank the 60 year old kid you'll make the news it would be exciting 
So it doesn't matter ages, but kids are an issue or finances are an issue or your health and mental disorder, you're struggling with it. You have cancer, everyone rallies around you, but if you have a mental disorder, you've got to keep it quiet, keep it to yourself, and you're struggling with it, and it's producing. No, it shouldn't, because you just we let go and open our hands to our Heavenly Father, and we say, Jesus Christ, you're king of my life. This is my road. You've given me this road. I'm going to trust you with it every step of the way. It's verbally submitting ourselves to kingdom thought. I have a friend, he just texted um, uh, yesterday just to check in. Uh, he has what's called, I think he calls it, did I write down his, his trophy room? He has 20 to 30 animals in this room mounted. And um, uh, it's, it's like, guys, it's the room. It's the pool table. It's the fireplace. I mean, it's uh, the elephant foot. He's 20 trips on African safaris, 20. Uh, his 20th is coming up this fall. So things I've never seen before. It seems wrong to kill a zebra, doesn't it? I love that gum, right? That little zebra gum. They just look so cute. But he's got one. We're sitting and talking, and he's uh, fairly wealthy. His friend, their best buddies, his friend sold his company for $87 million. And this guy, he's still working. And we're sitting in his trophy room. He's sitting there like he is every evening with a gin and tonic. He chooses to do that after work every day in his trophy room as he sits there and he's looking around and he says, I just feel guilty sometimes. I have too much. He said, but early on, and it was him and his friend and wives who said, early on, Let's just, let's just keep giving. we got to keep giving. We're like, that. that's great. He goes, honestly, I think we average probably 35% a year of what we make we give. He goes, it's not going to make a magazine. It's not going to be one of those reverse givers, right, the 90-10. He goes, I'm not one of them. But I, I think we've settled at 35. He goes, but it's bigger than that. And this was it. And seeing this man's man, it's a welding business. To hear him say, he goes, Susan and I, my wife and I, we, we believe in our heart whether we make 14000 a year or we make 400000 a year. It doesn't matter because we're content and happy in our life in our relationship with Jesus Christ and we trust him every step of the way. He goes, because I've lost everything. He goes, I've been down to Nothing. He goes, oh, I've lived in a trailer. I know what trailers are. He goes, it's actually not bad. He goes, I know what I'm saying when I say this. I live emptied and submissive to my Heavenly Father and my Lord Jesus Christ. And what He chooses to do after that, I'll take. He's on one of His hunting trips. It was in northern Arizona. It's one of his hunting trips. He wakes up and they, there's panic and his son had accidentally overdosed. Uh, late 20s. Died. He had to figure out how to get him out of This guy's not unaware of challenges. And he goes, no, it's... I, I know every day that he loves me and he takes care of me. He goes, that's how I live. It's under the reign and rule of our Heavenly Father. You may have some pretty pressing issues today. And it might be loss or health concerns. It might be mental disorder or a court case that you're waiting to close. It's taken forever. In the world's eyes, yeah, keep your relief in the world's eyes is when it's over. We live under the reign and rule of our Heavenly Father. The relief comes when we let go of it to Him. Let me end with this idea 
Uh, we have three kids, by the way. Uh, Sarah's sitting there. We have three kids. Uh, our oldest is, oh boy, uh, mid-20s. And our girl is in the middle there, and she's younger. And, wow, should have written some of this down. Um, notice I'm not giving names. And then the youngest, he's 20. Am I right? Boom. The young... Ross, right? Yes. Right. Ross is at um, uh, Maxwell Air Force Base right now doing field training, officer training uh, for uh, Air Force. He's going to be uh, planning on being a chaplain in the Air Force. And he's at Grand Canyon University. Our girl, the middle girl, she's a nurse at uh, downtown Phoenix and uh, just married during COVID uh, just recently. And... um, uh, married a great guy. Our oldest, Grant, works with the visually impaired, and he's married. He got married right at COVID. They're both introverts. They loved it. They loved the small wedding of like five people, so they thought that was fantastic. She's a counselor. Uh, kids are doing great. They walk with the Lord. That's all we want, right? I mean, I, I mean, they're, they're doing great. They walk with the Lord. But I remember when Grant, who's the 20-something, mid-20s, um, I remember, we remember when he was seven and he's at an uh, eye doctor appointment and they're doing it and they couldn't clear up his vision. And the optometrist, who was a family friend in Worcester, Ohio, a um, family member says that, yeah, I've been, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't see this very often. You need to take him. And so we go. has a disease called retinitis pigmentosa. It's called RP. And so there is no correction. So it's, it's just going to decrease. And so that's age seven or eight. And you're there. If you've had kids, and if you don't, Uh, You know, it's a niece and nephew. You could relate. It's all the plans that you had are changing right in front of you. And so by junior high, he's legally blind and seeing eye dog in high school. And it's a whole world of things that we never thought we'd ever have to understand or want to understand. See a little blind kid with a cane is kind of cute to see. There's, there's that side of it where he gets positive attention, but I am aware of those family members that have kids with other issues that people stay away from. That's dreadful. If there's anything for us to learn to live, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ knows your pain. He knows your hurt, where you've been, where you are, and what you don't know yet. He is well aware of it. He came and he died as a sacrifice for you. He died so that you could live within his kingdom, that you could every day wake up knowing 100% that you can live to the glory of God and anything that happens to you, to your family, will be for your good. That's how you can live. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest news in the world. We end up raising a kid, our oldest Grant is his name, that he ends up the deepest of all of us. He ends up with a faith deeper. He knew more about how to trust God when he was in junior high and high school than I did as a pastor. And I'm like, how is this happening? And it's like Jesus wants to look down and smile and go, I told you I had it. I told you it's okay. Your finances, from I got it. He goes, I told you it's fine. But the family's broken. All my dreams of the perfect family, you may say, are gone. I mean, it seems like it's, and he smiles and goes, hang on, hang on. Scoot under the umbrella. Stay under my reign and rule. It's going to be okay. That's what the gospel is. So the last thought is with the, um, in the Lord's Prayer. How do you pray? He goes, oh, you pray like this. It's full of kingdom thought. But not tucked in. Has to be at the start. 
This isn't a subject for later on. This is a subject for every day. When you and I wake up every day, we wake up and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, not mine. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Down here in my life, in the very same way and same degree that it's happening up there with you right now. That's a daily prayer. And so if you're struggling with decisions, the anxiety's there. You're going to bed at night thinking, I'm just going to give it to God because he's going to be up all night anyway. Right? Since he's going to be up all night anyway, I'm going to give it to him, and yet we stay up all night anyway. How do we do that? How do we live not knowing what's going to happen to our kids? Family members in jail for a long time, possibly. That's frustrating to you. You're, you're captivated by the thought. And you, oh, Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that with me right now, if you would. Our Father in heaven, as we're tight-fisted with concerns in our lives, we want to loosen our hands to you right now. We're loosening our hands to you, and we're saying, you are our heavenly Father. Hallowed be your name. We're asking that your kingdom would come into each of our lives through our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can trust our days. Your kingdom come right here in our lives today to the same degree as happening there with you right now. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.